I don't know, it's just something about him that rubbed me the wrong way. Thank you for coming, Lieutenant Argonar. I, I worked from Chairman Rockstein that you were off duty until further official orders from Council. There's a fine inn just along the street for you to stay at and wait for your orders. We've already arranged for Council to contact you there. That was a war. Well, wiped out my meteor. Was it magic energy? Council Chairman Roxton is one sharp man. He's been holding the reins ever since Ura became a republic 12 years ago. It's been a while since we changed from monarchy to republic, and I think it's made a big difference. Things are easier now. You would say by pressing the, the start button. <laughs> Gee, I wonder what that button was for. Would be for. Hey, can I tell you a secret? There wasn't any magic when my grandpa was a kid. Magic industrial revolution has made life easier, sure. It's also had a massive effect on nature. The magic industrial revolution is really something. It was completely different life before it came along. We're searching for my husband. We launched the 98th Armor Magic Troopers mission and heard us in the unit was sent battle with the tent. I'm so helpful, but. Helpful, but. Okay. That's weird. Oh. Lord Gungora, a member of the council, is also an expert in magic. No one can match him on a subject during the feud. I still think he's probably going to be a bad guy. Councilman Gungora is the greatest wizard of all of Ura. They say his political enemies feared him against him because of the power he built. And there's more proof that he's probably going to be the bad guy. They say magic energy brought, him, brought about the tragedy on the highland. That really worries me. Everyone's scared of magic power in the beginning. Look at all the little things in this stuff. I mean, wild animals, monsters, and police. Are there. <laughs> magic energy is frightening stuff, but it's also very powerful. The movement responsible for the research into applied magic is what created. <sighs> the magic or industrial revolution. Magic has drastically altered the ecosystem. No South Beast turned to raging monsters practically overnight. <laughs> Most council types only say things to make them look good. Listen and talk to you at a bar, so quickly find out the truth behind the scene. Mr. Bar. Hey, a bar. There have always been rumors that King Zippo, Zippo was assassinated. If then, that's true. My money is on Chairman Roxy. Just between me and you, I think that Gora was the one who killed King Zippo. Magic, magical, magic industrial revolution is the proof. The war is over, but hard time. This hard time continues. Ah, I want a drink to help me forget it for a while. My son-in-law happened in the Highlands of War. We don't know what's happened to him. My grandchildren are all still so little. The council is telling us we've won the war. Can it really be called a victory to cost this many lives? The Ken tag has been repelled, but our forces have been devastated. What's going to happen to us? Should 
Dirty immortal, sorry, the Highlands of War incident? Are you a human? Probably more human than you. Aquabomb. Pretty sure that's gonna be. Yep. Yep, water damage item. Another seed. Those beastly can't much attack or take our magic in industry. Apparently, goats that was north is pulling the strings behind the Kent pack. Essentially, they'll, they'll attack Aura directly. <laughs> this is the north main street in the city of Aura. You take your shop. You can take care of your shopping along with anything else you might need. Things are good when the old Zephyr was king. There's been something wrong with this country since it became a republic. Not gonna lie, I thought I was kicking the pole. I thought I was kicking the pole, and I was like, "How does that have an item?" My, you look worn out. An, there's an inn just over there. We can use some, sell some rest in proper bed. The husband and young woman next door has come back from the battlefield. What a shame. They're such a lovely couple. King Zippo ruled Ura until 12 years ago. After the queen's death, he couldn't bring himself to care about politics any longer. He loved her so much. And I think the people understood that. That's why they so readily accepted the Orange Republic Declaration. I wonder what Lord Tolton, king, king, son of King Zippa, is doing now. He's kind of an easy friend. Always compared to his magnificent father. It's often said that magic powers made life easier for everyone. But I like the only cause the power, power suddenly appear. Magic energy is made life easier. Everything you see here in Aura is thanks to the blessings of the Magic Industrial Revolution. The war is finally over, but it's such a cost to our fellow country. Magic engine is so useful. We just don't know how we ever did without it. Sorry about that. They're incredibly rare just 30 years ago. You're the Highlands of Wool, aren't you? My son was about too. You know, is he still alive? Let's go to this way first. Okay, I was just. Okay. I figured that's what it, this is where this was going to take us. There's a park bit down this road. We're in Gungora's mansion. Keep going after that. We're heading to Central Station. They can turn it, turn it to the intersection over there. The industrial area sprawls below the crown symbol of the magic industrial revolution. The people who live here make the lavish lifestyle of Laura possible. Won't be mad if I don't get home soon. I'm going to play a little longer. Go home, kid. No one's here today. Park Star.
Like what, is that supposed to be something like Dato? I was supposed to go shopping with my mom today. She suddenly changed her mind. What the hell was that thing? I have no idea. My mind, my mind goes to Gato from, from Chrono Trigger, and it was like not that. The woman's son died at the Highlands of Wall. Help me own some myth here, okay? I haven't heard anything from them. Such a lively young boy. I can't keep up with him at my age. Huh. This charm off is my son. Only me one thing. I knew it. I was kidding myself before, but really, I knew it. This is my grandfather's nameplate. Too near from the war long ago, they miraculously survived. Told me a fellow soldier saved his life in that one. But his nameplate was enough to be the same for my son. Thank you for taking the trouble to bring this to me. There's so many families since war with nothing to remember they're departed by. It may not be much, but I want you to have this. Help you make it to retirement, soldier. Oh wow, two poison oils. Wow. Uh, yeah, poison ring. Oh hey, cool. I have the ability to I can't fully make it, but hey, one more sticky tapes and I can make it. <laughs> Wind bomb. Seed. Why am I getting all this seed? <gasps> two in a row! I checked two things in a row and I got two things of seed in a row. This kit. Is this gonna give me seed? Cold water stone. Good. At least it wasn't seed again. Okay, one more and I can make an aqua aqua ring. On the next cutscene, I'm going to look to see what the heck um, Seed does. I see the same spot in front of his house. Really weird. Lord Gengor is not seeing anyone this time. Bring in tomorrow. I direct our orders from council. No one is allowed to see Lord Gengor. You up? Go away. Alright, we'll go to that end. Since this was that. Magma fragment, but that's one more and I can make a fire with the thing. Nope. Son of a bitch! Seriously, when I reach this next when I reach the next cutscene, I'm gonna look up what the heck these the seed died. Counselors, I propose that Gongora be removed from Grand Staff Project, with control transferred to this council. My lord. In addition, until Lieutenant Argonar completes his investigation, I propose that Gongora be confined to his residence under surveillance. Those who disagree with my proposal, raise your hands now. It appears I have no choice. But to agree 
I see there are no objections. It is decided. Okay, okay, so there are 99 seeds and give them 20, and when I get 20, I can give them to, to an NPC and get a reward. Okay. I expect no less from Capital Aura. Everything's so big, and, and check out all the match engines. I've been city for many years. Magic engines are all new. These stone buildings and roads haven't changed at all. We're doing a back door here. You don't belong here. Get out. No. Fuck you, old man. Fuck you, old man. Son of a bitch! They put these things everywhere. Pretty sure all these are locked. No. Oh. No, they're not. We'll just barge into people's hotel rooms. I've been over for a long time. This is my first time. I'm looking for a job to make something out of my life. To our dear guests. Do you have any questions, comments, or suggestions? Kindly write them down here. We came here for our honeymoon. We'll never forget this experience of a lifetime. We'll treasure it forever. Thank you. It rained the whole time. How could I have any fun? It's like bad weather just follows me around. Soldiers were loud. Everything was so expensive. <laughs> and I just want to go home. At least the girl was really cute. And her food was good. This is my first time in the city. It's been an interesting and meaningful trip. I'd like to finish it again. I came here to send my son off to the army. That's a kind-hearted boy. I'm worried they won't fit in with those military types. I just pray he'll be back safe. I rode on the monorail. I saw the castle. I played with the dog. I'm going to go to my grandma's house tomorrow. I can't wait. I have a decent amount of money. Like, I, right now I have 900. Great gate. This magnificent structure serves as the entrance to the city of Ura as well as providing protection from enemies. The monorail station has now become an essential part of Ura's transportation and it is one of the blessings from the magic industrial revolution. Downtown. The beautiful sights of Main Street are the most memorable parts of Ura. The, the, uh, the charmingly authentic flagstone boulevard melts seamlessly with the wonders of modern magic engine technology to create a wonderful blend of old and new Ura in one view. Unique view. The Palace. Even under Ura's modern republic government, the palace's majestic exterior continues to loom over Ura. Rebuild as part of magic industrial revolution. This sim symbolic structure continues to serve as one of the city's most recognizable buildings. Transportation aura. The monorail system is inexpensive and runs frequently, so it's your best choice for visiting downtown or the palace area. Those who prefer a more personal touch, magic taxis offer high level privacy. Some merchants even conduct their most important business meetings inside. You also can call those bribe things. Yeah. Anyway, we'll open up this chest. I only have one party member game. Why do I have three revival items? Holy Night Charm. Ooh. 
Ooh, okay. We'll take that. Increased magical and physical defense during critical HP stat. Welcome. The council has told me about you. Please enjoy your stay. As Kain slips into deep sleep, his dream unfolds. A dream or his past. At this moment, there is no way he could know. That was one of the most messed up dream sequences I've ever seen. Time recalls a memory that was locked deep within his heart. A dream has been revealed. The family members have tears in their eyes when they welcome Cain back to the inn for his long journey. Thank you so much for coming. He understands the situation immediately. The time for departure is drawing near. Anna is departing. Too... Okay, cool. Too soon. Too soon. But still, he knows this day would have to come sometime. And not in the distant future. I might never see you again. He said to him with a sad smile when he left on this journey. Her smiling face almost transparent and even white in its white. So fragile. So, so fragile. And therefore, indescribably beautiful as she lay in bed. May I see Hannah now? Yes. The innkeeper gives him a tiny nod and says, I don't think she'll know who you are, though. She hasn't opened her eyes since last night, he warned him. You can tell from the slight movement of her chest that she's clinging to a frail thread of light. But it could snap any moment. It's such a shame. I know you made a special point to come here for her. Another tear glides down the wife's cheek. Never mind. It's fine, Kaim says. He has been present in innumerable deaths, and his experience has taught him much. That takes away the power of speech first, first of all. Then the ability to see. What remains alive to the very end, however, is the power to hear. Even though the person has lost consciousness, it is by no means unusual for the voices of the family to bring both to your smiles or tears. Kai pulls his arm around the woman's shoulders and says, I have lots of travel stories to tell her. I've been looking forward to this my whole time on the road. Instead of smiling, the woman releases another large tear and nods to Kai. And Hannah was so looking forward to hearing your story. Her sobs almost drowned out her words. The innkeeper says, I wish I could urge you to rest up from your travels before you see her, but time interrupts his apologies. Of course, I'll see her right away. There's very little time left. Hannah, the only daughter of the innkeeper's wife, will probably 
or use her last before the sun comes down. Time lowers his pack to the floor and quietly opens the door to Hannah's room. Hannah was frail from birth. Far from enjoying the opportunity to travel, she rarely left the town or even the neighborhood in which she was born and raised. This child would probably not live to adulthood, uh, the doctor told her parents. To this tiny girl with extraordinary, beautiful, doll -like, extraordinarily beautiful doll-like features, God should doubt an all too sad destiny. He allowed her to be born, the only daughter of the innkeepers to a small inn by the highway, perhaps once more after Tumman thus completed. Iniquity. I might be saying that word wrong. Hannah was unable to go anywhere. The guests who stayed at her parents' inn would tell her stories of the countries and towns and landscapes and people that she would never know. When were new guests arrived at the inn, Hannah would ask them, Where are you from? Where are you going? Can you tell me a story? She would sit and listen to their stories with sparkling eyes urging them on to new episodes with them. And then, and then, when they left the inn, she would beg them, please come back and tell me lots and lots of stories about faraway countries. She would stand there waving until the person disappeared far down the highway, give one lonely sigh, and go back to bed. Anna is sound asleep. No one else is in the room. Perhaps an indication that she has long since passed on the stage where doctors can do anything. Time sits down in chair, a chair next to the bed and says with a smile, Hello, Hannah. I'm back. She does not respond. Her little chest, still without the swelling of a grown woman. What the fuck? What the fuck? Why was that needed? Why is that needed? Why did we need that line? Rises and falls almost in per in imperceptibly but seriously why do we need still without the swelling of a grown woman what the fuck what the fuck writers I went far across the ocean this time he tells her shoot me the ocean on the side where the sun comes up I took a boat from the harbor way, way, way far beyond the mountains you can still see from this window. And it was on the sea from the time the moon was perfectly round until it got smaller and smaller, then bigger and bigger until it was full again. There was nothing but ocean as far as the eye could see. Just the sea and sky. Can you imagine, Hannah? You've never seen the ocean. I'm sure people have told you about it. It's like a huge, endless puddle. Time struggles to himself. It seems to that Hannah's pale white cheek moves slightly. She can hear him. Even if she cannot speak or see, her ears are still alive. Believing and hoping this to be true, time continues the story of his travel. He speaks no words of parting. As always, time smiles with, gent with special gen gentleness he has never shown to anyone else. And he goes on telling his tales with a bright voice. Sometimes even coming the story with exaggerated gestures. He tells her about the blue ocean. He tells her about the blue sky. He says nothing about the violent sea battle that stained the ocean red. He never tells her about those things. <sighs> I'm very sorry about all the sniffling I'm doing. I'm doing, I'm doing. I'm very sorry about that. Hannah was still a tiny girl when time first visited the inn. When she asked him, Where are you from? And will you tell me some stories? With her childish pronunciation and innocence. Well, I felt a soft glow in his chest. At the time, he was returning from battle. More precisely, he had, he had ended one battle. It was on his way to the next. Sorry about that. His life consisted of traveling from one battlefield to another. Nothing about this has changed to this day. He has taken the lives of countless enemy troops and witnessed the deaths of countless comrades on the battlefield. Moreover, the only thing separating enemies from comrades was the slightest stroke of fortune. Had the gears of destiny turned a slightly different way, his enemies would have been comrades as 
comrades, enemies. This is the fate of the mercenary. He was spiritually worn down back then and had been feeling unbearably lonely. As the possessor of eternal life, time had no fear of death, which was precisely why each of the soldiers' faces were stored in fear, why each face of man who died in agony was burned permanently to his brain. Ordinarily, he would spend the nights on the road drinking, immersing himself in alcoholic stupor, or pretending to. He was trying to make himself forget the unforgettable. However, with when, however, he saw Hannah, Hannah smile as she begged him for stories about his long journey, he felt a warm, far warmer and deeper comfort than he ever could obtain from liquor. He told her many things about a beautiful flower that he discovered on the battlefield, about the bewitching beauty of the mist filling the forest the night before the final battle, about the marvelous taste of spring water in the ravine where he and his men had fled after a losing battle about the vast, bottomless blue sky he saw after a battle. <laughs> he never told her anything sad. He kept his mouth shut about the human ugliness and stupidity he en witnessed endlessly on the battlefield. He concealed his position as a mercenary, he kept silent regarding his reasons for traveling constantly. He only spoke of things that were beautiful and sweet and lovely. Sees now that he told Hana only beautiful stories in a world like this, not so much out of concern for purity, but for his own sake. Staying at the inn where, ha where Hana waited to see him turned out to be one of kind of small pleasures. Telling her about the memories he brought back from his journeys, he felt some degree of salvation, however slight. Five years, ten years. His friendship with the girl continued. Little by little, she neared adulthood, which meant that, as doctors had predicted, each day brought her that much closer to death. And now, time ends the last travel story he will share with her. He can never see her again, never tell her stories again. Before dawn, when the darkness of night is at its deepest, Long pauses enter into Hannah's breathing. The frail thread of her life is about to snap as Kaim and her parents watch over her. The tiny light that is lodged in Kaim's breast will be extinguished. His lonely travels will begin again tomorrow. His long, long travels without end. You'll be leaving on your own, own travels every own soon, Hannah, Kaim tells her gently. Yeah. You'll be leaving for a world that, sh that no one knows. A world that has never entered into any of the stories you've heard so far. Finally, you'll be able to leave your bed and walk anywhere you want to go. You'll be free. He wants her to know that death is not sorrow, but a joy mixed with tears. It's your turn. Be sure and tell everyone about the memories of your journey. Her parents will make that same journey soon. And someday... Hana will be able to meet all the guests she had known at the end, far beyond the sky. I, however, can never go there. I can never escape this world. I can never see you again. This is not goodbye. It's just the start of your journey. He speaks his final words to her. We'll meet again. His final lie to her. Anna makes her departure. Her face, her face is transfused with a tranquil smile. She, she just said, "See you soon." Her eyes will never open again. A single tear lies slowly down her cheek. Time's mind is filled with lost pieces of past memory. Certain sites or conversations can bring these memories back in the form of dreams. The view episodes of Thousand Dreams again, 
rest in any in or bed, and select them from the start menu. You can view these episodes any number of times. When viewing an episode from Thousand Years of Dreams, you can pause it by pressing the start button or cancel it by pressing the back button. I'm going to save again. Sleep well. No messages for you yet. Hold any messages that come for you here. So please, don't hesitate to throw outside. I'm sure, you'd like to forget the horse in the battlefield. Oh, by the way, feel free to use any of the items you find here. Your compliments to the house. Well, we already kind of explored here, so. Stop stealing shit. No! Why did you sound offended? I mean, I'm an it's JRPG. I'm allowed to take stuff. Also, why is this giving Final Fantasy vibes? Because this is a, because uh, looking this up real quick. The if the music does, it's it's um oh, it's um yeah. Wait, 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 let go! My throat! My throat! Uh, gonna, Damn! What's your it's Nobu Umeatsu. Uh, Umeatsu. So it's you're, you're so it's him. I, I mean, Lord Gagor asked me to do it. Uh, it's the truth. I'm supposed to tell you. Uh, it it's also the story was also written by Sakaguchi, the creator of the Final Fantasy series too. You are. So this kind of is a little bit. Jansen, messenger for Lord Gagor. And damn it. Yeah, it it basically it's the po. It's essentially supposed to be people. People want to say this is Final Fantasy thirteen, the real one. But it's like I don't like that. I also haven't played played uh, FF thirteen. I actually need to though. But from what I've played, I actually do enjoy it. it I think it's actually pretty. Pretty decent game. Oh, hello there. Come on, you're fresh in Battlefield 2, aren't you? Just be able to someone upstairs big time, huh? Gotta feel like a heel, thinking about all my dead buddies. But having another chance to see your family, well, well, that's a great feeling. I think I actually make it out of this alive after all. I have no idea what I'm gonna do when it's time to knock on my family's front door. Oh, hey. Dreams have been revealed. Alone in a crowd of rugged men, nursing his drink on the far corner of the old post of the old post town's only tavern. Time. A single man strides in through the tavern door. Massively built, he wears the garb of a warrior. His soiled uniform seeks a long journey. Fatigue marks his face, but his eyes were a penetrating gleam. Look of a fighting man on active duty. The hero's return. The tavern's dim hushes instantly. Every drunken eye in the place fastens on the soldier with awe and gratitude. The long war with the neighboring country has ended at last, and the men who fought on the front lines are returning to their home. So, so it is with this military man. I'm going to real quick check to see if there are any missable dreams, by the way. Uh, uh, 
Okay. Okay, okay, okay. So, okay. So dreams are not missable until I reach the final dungeon. So apparently that's a point of no return thing. I don't know. Uh, there. The soldier takes a seat at the table next to Kaim. He downs a slug of liquor with the fallen force on so hard drinker. Man who drinks to kill his pain. <laughs> Two cups. Three. Four. Another customer approaches him, ball in hand, wearing an inter ingratating grin. The typical craft of time punk. Let me offer you a drink, Guido's demand. I so good with gratitude for your heroic efforts on behalf of the fatherland. The soldier unsmilingly allows the man to fill his cup. I was at the front. I'm sure you performed many valiant deeds on the battlefield. The soldier empties his cup in silence. There we go. The punk refills his cup and stops ever more fawning smile. Now that we're friends, how about telling me some more tales? You got such big, strong arms. How many enemy soldiers did you kick? Without a word, the soldier hurls the contents of his cup into the man's face. The punk flies into rage and draws his knife. No sooner does it leave its sheath than Kaim's fist sends it flying through the air. Faced with powerful united fronting, Kaim and a soldier, the punk runs out muttering curses. The two big men watch him go, and then share a faint smile. Kaim doesn't have to speak to the soldier to know that he lives in deep sadness. First part, the soldier, having cheated death many number of times, is aware of the shadow that lurks in Kaim's expression. The tavern's din returns. Kaim and the soldier pour each other drink. I've got a wife and daughter I haven't seen since I shipped out. It's been three long years. He lets himself smile shyly now. For the first time, he takes a photograph of his wife and daughter from his pocket and shows it to Kaim. The wife of a woman of, dew of dewy freshness. The, the, the daughter is still very young. They're the reason I survived. The thought of going home to them alive was all that had sustained me in battle. Excuse me. Is your home far from here? No. My village is just over the next pass. I'm sure they've heard the news that the war is over and they can hardly wait to have me home. You'd get there tonight if you wanted to badly enough. It was half full. But the soldier bound to mouth full of liquor and grunt. Afraid. Afraid? Of what? I want to see my daughter and wife and daughter, but I'm afraid of them to have, to have them see me. I don't know how many men I've killed in the past few years. I had no choice. I had to do it in order to stay alive. If I was going to get back to my family, I had no choice but to kill one enemy soldier after another. Each and every one of those men the families they had left at home. It was the code of war, the soldier's destiny. To stay alive in battle, you had to go on killing men before they could kill you. I've had no time to think about such things at the front. I was too busy trying to survive. I see it now, though. And now that the war is over. Three years of sin are carved into my face. This is the face of a killer. I don't want to show this face to my wife and daughter. The soldier pulls out a leather pouch when she withdraws a small stone. He tells Kaim. He tells Kaim it is an unpaused gemstone. <laughs> something he found shortly after he left for the battlefield. A gemstone? I'm asked, unconvinced. The stone on the table is dull black without the hint of the gleam the gem should have. It sparkled when I first found it. I'm sure my daughter would have, would love it when I brought it home to her. Gradually, though, the stone lost its gleam and turned cloudy. Every time 
I killed an enemy soldier. It's really like the stain of his blood would rise to the surface of the stone. And you see, it's almost all black now after three years. The stone, the stone is stained by the sins I committed. I call it my sin. No. You don't have to blame yourself so harshly this time. You had to do it to stay alive. I know that, says the soldier. I know that. But still, just like me, the men I killed in villages go home. Families waiting for the bear. <laughs> the soldier said, then says to Kai, You too, I suppose. You must have family. Kai gives his head a little shake. Not me, he says. No family. A whole village, at least? I don't have any place to go home to. You're a traveler, eh? That's me. The soldier chuckles ch softly and gives Kaim a sour smile. It's hard to tell how fully he believes what Kaim has told him. He slips a sin stone to the letter pouch and says, You know what I think? If the stone, ever tur stone turned darker every time he took life, it ought to get some screen back every time I saved a life. Should be. Instead of answering, Kaim draws the last last drops of liquor from his cup and rises from the table. The soldier remains in his chair and Kaim, staring down at him, offers him these words of advice. If you have a place you can go home to, you should go to it. Just go, no matter how much guilt you have weighing you down. I'm sure your wife and daughter will understand. You know, Kermit, you're a hero. You find your heart to stay alive. I'm glad I met you, says the soldier. I needed to hear that. He holds his right out, a right hand out to Kaim, grasps it in return. I hope your travel will go well, says the soldier. And your, your travels will soon be over, says Kaim with a smile, turning to the door. Just then, the punk charges at Kaim from behind, wielding a pistol. Watch out, fellow soldier, and rushes after Kaim. As Kaim ro rolls around, the punk takes aim and shouts. You can't treat me like that, you son of a bitch. The soldier flies between the two men and takes a bullet in the gut. And so, as he desperately wished to do so, the soldier has saved someone's life. Ironically, it's sort of a life of kind, a man who can neither age nor die. That the soldier has traded his one only life. Sprawled onto the floor, the only conscious soldier thrust the leather pouch in Kaim's hand. Look at my sense, though. Will you? Maybe. Maybe, he says, chuckling. Someone's shining, he's come back. Blood spurts from his mouth, strangling the lad. Kaim looks inside the bag and says, it's sparkling. It's clean. This, asked the soldier, good. My daughter will be so glad. He smiles with satisfaction and holds his hand up in the pouch. Gently, Kaim lays the pouch on the palm of his hand and holds the man's fingers over it. The soldier draws his last breath and the pouch falls to the floor. The dead man's face wears a peaceful expression. The stone, however, the man's sin, though, is his rolls from the open pouch, just black as ever. So I don't think that there'll be anything there. Why did Discord like this? What happened? It cut you off. <laughs> Give me a 
fucking Zeta is acting up again. <laughs> Are you here before? No. Discord. I really have no idea what the issue is. <laughs> it only hates me. Yeah, it's like it never happened. It's never happened to me. Except that one time. Yeah, yeah, once. Okay, so we still can't go there. Have you heard about this? A connection of mine in the council told me Councilman Gengora has been confined to his private state. Could it be true? The soldiers from his house aren't protecting him. Better keeping him in there? We never wanted to hear. Good job. I just realized that. Oh, it's the end. I thought that was purple. We didn't go into purple ain't either. The owner of the store often goes traveling to find quality on I appreciate it's new sense we can't shop all the way. That upsets me. Well, guess we'll have to wait until he comes back. Now we're just basically running around looking for more for Dream. Stealing dreams. I mean, technically, I'm not since they're times. They're times. They're dreams. Times. Why do you walk around in a fucking circle? There's dreams times had from the past. Stop stealing people's dreams. No. <laughs> I'm not a Gengar. You know what I mean. Are you new, you new person? I don't remember you. No, okay. Okay. Okay, so we can't do anything else here. No, nope, I'm just supposed to. I'm stealing fucking dreams. No. Like I said, I'm not a Gengar. Now I'm imagining a Gengar just running off with dream capsules. I mean, to be fair, Dream Eater. And yes, for, yes, I do know that Dream Eater is can be learned by a lot of Pokemon. I, I honestly, I symbolize that move way more with Gengar. Yes, White flowers. Lovely white flowers mark the town. They bloom on every street corner, not in beds or fields set aside for their cultivation, but blending naturally in profusion with every row of houses. 
as though build the buildings and blossoms have grown up together. The season is early spring, and snow still lingers on the nearby mountains, but the stretch of ocean that gently laps the town's southern shore is bathed in, in refulgent sunlight. This is an old and prosperous town harbor town. Even now, each day its piers see many cruise ships and freighter freighters come and go. <laughs> its history, however, is sharply divided between the time before and time after an event has ha that happened one day long ago. The people here prefer not to talk about it. The water set engraved upon the town's chronology. The memories are too sorrowful to make stories out of them. Time knows this, and because he knows it, he has to come here once again. Passing through, the tavern asks, Master asks him. At the sound of his voice, I am response with a faint smile. You're here for the festival, I suppose. You should, you should take your time and enjoy it. The man is, is in high spirit. His spirit. He has joined his customers in glass after glass until now, and, until now, quite red in the face. No one shows any signs of blaming him for overindulging. Every seat in the tavern is chilled, and the air reverberates with laughter. Happy voices can be heard now, and all is well from the outside. The entire town is celebrating. Once each year, the festival is people making merry all night long until the sun comes up. I hope you've got room for the night, sir. Too late, too late to find one now. Every inn, every inn is full of overflowing. So it seems. Not anyone would be foolish enough to spend a night like this quietly tucked away under the covers of his room. The time in the tavern master winks a kind of day. Not you, sir, I'm sure. Today we're going to have the biggest, wildest party you've ever seen. And everybody's invited. Locals or not. Drink, food, gambling, women. Just let me know what you want. I'll make sure you have it. Time drinks his, sips his drink and says nothing. Because he's planning to stay awake all night, he's not taking a room, though he has no plans to enjoy the festival either. <laughs> Time will be offering up a prayer the hour before dawn, when the night is at its darkest and deepest. He'll leave the town, sent off by the morning sun as he pokes his face up between the mountains and the sea. This is did at his last visit. Back then, the tavern master, a few minutes ago, was telling one of his regular customers that his first grandson was, was about to be born, he was himself just an infant. This one's on me. Drink up, says the tavern master, filling the team's shot glass. He appears to came suspiciously and says, You did come for the festival, didn't you? No, not really. It's just came. Time. I know I'm saying came. Time. Don't tell me you didn't know about it. You mean you mean you gave me a pure chance? Right, so. Well, if you're in business, forget it. I'm never going to serious talk out of anybody, especially a night like this. The tavern master goes on explaining what's so special about this night. You must have heard something about it. Once long ago, long, long time ago, this town was almost completely destroyed. There are two time, times... There are two kinds of events that divide history into before and after. One is the birth or death of some great personal, a hero or a savior. The other is something like a war or plague, a natural disaster. What divided this town's history into before and after was a violent earthquake. It came without warning, it gave the soundly sleeping people of town no chance to flee. A crack opened up in the earth with a roar, and roads and buildings just fell to pieces. Fire started, and in this, in, in they spread in the twinkling of an eye. Almost everyone was killed. <laughs> you can't. You probably can't imagine. All I know is that they taught me is is what they taught me in school, and what the what does resurrection festival mean to kid? This is something that happened once upon a time. I live here, and that's all it means to me. The traveler like you probably can't begin to imagine what it's like. Is that what they call this holiday? Resurrection Festival? Uh-huh. 
The town was resurrected from total ruin to this. That's kind of that's what the celebration seems about. Time gives the man a grim smile and dips his liquor. What's so funny? Have an ask, master ask. <laughs> Last time I was here, they were calling it Earthquake Memorial Day. It was a festival for this kind of wild celebrating. What are you talking about? It's been a resurrection festival ever since I was a kid. That was before you were old enough to remember anything. Huh? Before that, they called it a consolation of spirit. They burned a candle for each person who died and pray for them. Pray, pray, and pray for them to rest in peace. It was a sad festival. Lots of crying. You sound as if you saw it happening yourself. It. The town master laughs with a loud snort. You look sober, but you want to plaster out of your mind. Now listen, it's festival night, so I'm going to let you off the hook for pulling my leg. Let's say stuff like that in front of the other townspeople. All our ancestors, mine including, are the ones who barely saved their lives. Time knows full well what he is doing. He never expected the man to believe him. He just wanted to find out for himself whether the townspeople are still handing down memories of the tragedy, whether deep down behind their laughing faces, they're still lingering the sorrow that have passed down from their forefathers' time. <laughs> Called away by one of his, his other customers, the tavern master leaves time's leaves time side, but not without first delivering a warning. Be careful what you say, sir. That kind of nonsense can get you in trouble. Really, think about it. The earthquake happened all 200 years ago. I'm just not answering. Instead, he sips his liquor in a silence. Among the ones who died in the tragedy 200 years years ago were his wife and daughter. Of all a dozen of the wives and children that Kaim has had in his eternal life, the wife and child he had here were especially unforgettable. Okay, so they just revealed that Kaim's a polygamist. Right. In those days, I had a job at uh, the harbor. There's just the three of them. He, his wife, and their little girl. They lived sim ha simply and happily. The same kind of days that pre preceded today would continue on to endless tomorrow. Everyone in town believed that, including Kime's wife and daughter, of course. But Kime knew differently, precisely because his own life was long without end, and he can consequently taste the pain of countless parting. Time knew all too well that, in, well that in the daily life of humans, there was no forever. The life his family was leading would have to end sometime. It could go on, it could not go on forever. This was no means of cause for sorrow, however. The night I grasped upon forever, human beings knew how to love and cherish the here and now. Time especially loved to show his daughter flowers. The more fragile and short-lived, the better. Flowers that bloomed with the morning, with the morning sun and scattered before the sun went down. They were everywhere in this harbor town. Lovely white flowers that bloomed in early spring. Oh, oh, me. His daughter loved the flower. She was a gentle child who would never break off blossoms that struggled so bravely to bloom. Instead, she simply watched them for hours at a time. That year, too. Look how big the buds are. They'll be blooming any time now, she said happily when she found the white flowers on the road near the house. Tomorrow, maybe? Came, came wondered aloud. Absolutely, his wife chimed in merrily. Get up early tomorrow morning and have a look. Poor little flowers, though, said the daughter. It's nice when they bloom. Then they wither right away. All the better, said Kime's wife. It's good luck if you get to see them blooming. That makes it more fun. It may be fun for us, answered the girl. But think about the poor flowers. They worked so hard to open up, and they wither the same, the same day. It's sad. But yes, I guess so. A momentary air of sadness flowed into the room. We kind of quickly dispelled it with the land. Happiness is not the same thing as longevity, he claimed. What does that mean, Papa? It may not bloom for long. Flowers happy if it can open up the prettiest blossom of the sweetest perfume. 
It knows how to make him while it is good. The girl seemed to be having trouble grasping it, but simply nodded with a little sigh. She then broke up into, into a smile and said, It must be true if you say so, Papa. Your smile is more beautiful than any flower in full bloom. He should have said it to her. Time later regretted, regretted that he had. The words he had uttered so carelessly, he came to realize, were not to be something of a prophecy. Well now, young lady, he said, if you're getting up early to see the flowers tomorrow morning, you better go to bed right now. All right, Papa, if I really have to, I'm going to bed now too, said Time. Okay then, good night, Papa, Five said Good night, dear. I really am going to bed now. Good night, I am replied, enjoying one last cup these the days to be. These turn out to be the last words the family shared. A violent earthquake struck the town before dawn. Time's half house collapsed in a heap of trouble. Time's two loved ones departed for that distant other world before they could have their to wake him in their deep sleep without having had a chance to say good morning to him. The, sun, the morning sun rose on town and destroyed in an instant. Amid the flowers, trouble the flowers are blooming. The white flowers that Kaim's daughter had wanted so badly to see. I have thought to lay a flower on an offering of the flower's cold corpse, but abandoned the idea. He could not bring himself to pick a flower. No one, no living being on the face of the earth, he realized, had the right to snatch the life of a flower that possessed that life for only one short day. I could never say to his daughter, You first go first to heaven, wait for me. I'll be there before long. Nor would he ever know the joy of union with love. So a thousand years by bearing the pain of a thousand years of parting. Time continued his long journey. A dizzying number of years and months flowed by. Years and months during which the num num numberless wars and natural climbing scout scourged the earth. <laughs> People were born and they died. They loved each other and were parted from the ones they loved. There were joys beyond measure and sorrows just as meaningless. People fought and argued without, but they also loved and forgave each other endlessly. Thus was history built up as the tears of the past evolved gradually into prayers for the future. Time continued his long journey. After a while, he rarely thought about the wife and daughter with whom he spent those few, for a few days in the harbor. He never forgot them. Time continued his long journey, and in the course of his travel, he stopped by this harbor town again. As the night deepened, the din of the crowds only increased, but now, as a hint of light comes from the eastern sky, without a signal from silence, silence, a signal for anyone. A noise gives way to silence. I haven't been standing in the town central square. The revelers, too, have found their way when here in time, until almost everyone who before he knows it. Some fill closets filled with people. Time feels a tap on the soldier. I didn't expect to find you here, says the tavern master. When time gives him a silent smile, Tavern Master looks somewhat embarrassed and says, There's something I forgot to tell you before. Oh? Well, you know, the earthquake happened a long time ago. Before my father and mother's time. Even before my grandparents' generation. It might sound funny for me to say this, but I can't imagine this town room. I know what you mean. I do think, though, that there are probably things in this world that you can remember. And even if you not have not actually experienced them. Like the earthquake. I haven't forgotten it. I'm not the only one. There's a double space between I'm not and the only one. <laughs> I'm sorry. I should be laughing, laughing, but it's like that's it. But it's like it's kind of funny. It may have happened 200 years ago, but nobody in this town has ever forgotten it. 
We can't imagine it. We can't forget it either. I'm not. I also was doing that to basically make fun of the uh, proofreaders. Nah, it's a simple mistake. Mistake. It's like it's a simple mistake. I just, I just kind of like to point out. It pointed out just to, eh. It's a little. It's a. It's a neat little. It's a neat little mistake. Just as Kaim nods again, signals understanding of the tavern keeper's words. A somber melody echoes throughout the square. This is the hour when the earthquake destroyed the town. All the people assembled here closed their eyes, clasped their hands together, and offered up a prayer. The tavern master and Kaim among them. The Kaim's closed eyes come the smiling faces of the dead wife and daughter. Why are those they so beautiful and so sad? These faces that believe with all their hearts that tomorrow's sure to come. The music ends. The morning sun climbs above the horizon. And everywhere throughout the town bloom countless white flowers. In 200 years, the white flowers have changed. The scientists that have I did not press press the A button. I did not press the A button. I'm going to actually get up a... I'm actually going to look up a thing for that so I can reread that last line. I really did not press a button. Oh, we, oh, okay. Oh, oh. I also found a few, that we also have a few more here in Ura. Okay. Okay, there we go. In 200 years, the white flowers have changed. The scientists have hypothesized that the earthquake may have changed the nature of the soil itself, but no one knows the cause for sure. The lives of the flowers have lengthened. That's that's what it's skipping. Again, I didn't press a button. That's it. That just jumped automatically. Uh, Jimmy. Where where before they would bloom and wither in the space of a single day? Now they hold their blooms for three day three and four days at a time. Moistened by the dew of night, bathed in the light of the sun, the white flowers strive to live their lives to the fullest. Beautifying the, beautifying the town as if striving to live out the portion of life denied to those whose tomorrows were snatched away from them forever. We are going. I'm. We are, we are going to go and get the get those other ones. Two of these I actually never would have thought, never would have get, never would have guessed in in a in a lot in a long time. Oh no! Oh no! Oh no, did the game crash? Did we save? No. God damn it. No, not turn it off. All right.